What we are sure of is that to get the raw materials to the pyramid site, the Egyptians had to wait for the flood. From July to October, the barges were berthed on the edge of the desert. The entire valley was covered in water during those months, and the peasants had to wait for it to recede. During this long period of idleness, the pharaoh's servants had an extremely large labour force available to them. During digs at the burial sites beside the pyramids, Zehi Hawes worked out how the builders were recruited. This is our most recent discovery tomb that was found. This is the tomb of Kai, who was a priest, and this tomb dated to Dynasty IV, about 4,600 years ago. The pharaoh's priests were excellent administrators. On the walls of the tomb of Kai, who served Cheops, the whole peasant population walks in procession. Inscriptions in Kai's tomb tell us precisely when they joined the building site. And he's telling us here that he paid them beer and bread. He made them to make an oath and say that they are very happy, they are satisfied that they about this payment. They saying, they swore that they were satisfied. They said by the name of God, we are very happy. In exchange for their labor, Egyptian workmen received the basic necessities of life. They were grateful to the pharaoh and devoted to him. The construction of the pyramids was made possible by this contract of mutual assistance that they had with their sovereign. Modern Giza now lives and dies in the shadow of the pyramids. They are testimonials in stone to the social organization of ancient Egypt. But can we believe that the pyramids were built only to occupy the Egyptian people during the four months of flood time? Zehi Hawes argues that the building program had another, much stronger purpose a symbolic one. And the pyramid is their national project. Then all of them, they unite. All of them. King, nobleman, official, workman, farmers, all of them together work to help the king to be a god. And this is why my idea that the pyramid is a national project. It is the most important thing to the mind of the Egyptian. Without this help, the king will never build his pyramid. And this is why the pyramid was a symbol of unification of the two countries, Upper and Lower Egypt. So part of the veil has now been lifted. For over 2,000 years, the Egyptians united to accomplish a common project, a symbol of their strength and unity. From the stone mastabas to the Giza site, almost a hundred pyramids were built in Egypt. They were the first stone monuments in the history of mankind. The Egyptians built a symbol of the power of their nation in the heart of their land. In this land, the pyramid, the king's house for eternity, 
rose like a drop of radiant light towards the heavens. In the history of ancient Egypt, the Nile was all. Its course tells us more than any epic. It was the frontier between life and death, the path to the sun and the stars. It was more than a river. It was a god whose will was carved in stone. The untamable Nile was an integral part of ancient Egypt. Yet the Nile was tamed. In 1961, under President Nasser, construction of the Aswan Dam began. It took 10 years to complete, 10 years of hard labor to control the annual flood. The Nile is no longer a god. It has become a tame, quiet river. The Nile, like the pyramids, had to pay tribute to the modernization of Egypt. To harness its energy, modern-day Egyptians had to give up some of its benefits. Today, the land of the valley is no longer fertilized by silt borne away from the mountains of Ethiopia. Fertilizer has replaced the flood. What became of the legacy of ancient Egypt? What do the pyramids stand for today? J'ai souvent eu le sentiment que actuellement l'Égypte était un, parfois un peu coupée de son passé, qui n'était en fait qu'une qu'une fabuleuse ressource comme une autre. C'est-à-dire que les monuments, évidemment, sont, attirent les gens et sont donc, font du tourisme une des premières ressources de l'Égypte. Et ça, c'est quelque chose que, par exemple, Champollion, pionnier en tout, avait déjà très bien vu. Parce que quand il, a, quand il quitte l'Égypte à la fin de son unique voyage en 1829, il laisse à Mohamed Ali euh, une note pour la, sur la protection des, des monuments égyptiens. Il donne une liste des monuments qu'il faut sauver, etc. Et il, et alors que le mot même n'existe pas encore, il voit très bien ce que sera le tourisme avec sa, son, son aspect économique, c'est-à-dire venir dépenser ses devises. Et il le dit textuellement, il dit ça attirera des gens lettrés, euh, etc., qui viendront dépenser, enrichir leur pays de leurs dépenses. Cette, euh, cette masse de pierres, c'est probablement le, le symbole le plus évident l'image la plus évidente que que que, que l'on a quand on quand on parle de quand on prononce le nom le mot le nom de l'Égypte ancienne avec quelques obélisques sphinx ou quelques mots comme ça qui font à la fois fantasmer et, euh, et rêver Ancient Egypt gave way to a cosmopolitan nation Turkish then Arab a land of explorers Egypt will benefit from its heritage for a long time to come because much still lies beneath the desert sands. Today, Cairo has become a megalopolis, stretching along a quiet river. Modern Egyptians are builders too. <laughs> 